For example 4, we have a 35 year old woman who simply reports a history of a heart murmur. This is heard best at the third left intercostal space. This time, listen for the timing, the shape, and the quality. Hopefully the timing for this murmur sounds different than for the previous three examples. That's because this is a diastolic murmur. Its shape, decrescendo, and what about its quality? I think many people would agree that it sounds blowing in nature. Let's listen again. Okay, final diagnosis, aortic insufficiency. Once more. Example 5. A 45-year-old man from West Africa now has shortness of breath. This murmur is loudest at the apex. Timing, it's also diastolic, shape, uniform, and pitch, low. So what would cause a uniform, low-pitched diastolic murmur at the apex? Really, only one thing could do this, mitral stenosis. Why is it relevant that the patient is from West Africa? Because the most common cause of mitral stenosis by far is childhood rheumatic fever, a disease nearly unheard of in the developed world in the 21st century. Here's the murmur once more. And here's our last example. This is a 75 year old woman with shortness of breath and chest pain. The murmur is heard equally well throughout the chest. What's the timing here? The murmur sort of sounds continuous, but if you listen closely, you can tell that there are two distinct parts to it one part in systole, and one part in diastole. This is an example of two murmurs superimposed on one another. Listen again. So what's the pathology causing this? This is combined aortic stenosis and aortic regurgitation. Once more. I'm going to talk briefly about what the evidence is for using heart murmurs to make diagnoses. Despite all my preceding discussion, description of murmurs may still seem highly subjective and difficult. It may lead you to wonder how useful a skill it actually is. Here's a chart borrowed from Steve McGee's excellent textbook, Evidence-Based Physical Diagnosis. Here, McGee has compiled various studies looking at the sensitivities and specificities of what clinicians identified as a, quote, characteristic murmur. As one should expect, these numbers vary based on the severity of underlying valvular disease. For example, the murmur of mitral regurgitation is 56 to 75% sensitive when detecting echocardiographic MR of any severity, but increases to a sensitivity of 84 to 93% when detecting either moderate or severe disease. Overall, these numbers compare pretty favorably to the test characteristics of other parts of the physical exam. There are two notable exceptions. First, regarding tricuspid regurgitation. Because mild TR is very common and rarely audible, the presence of the characteristic murmur has only a 23% sensitivity 
for TR of any severity. Luckily, mild TR is rarely of any clinical significance. The second exception is an even lower sensitivity for detecting pulmonary regurgitation. For a variety of reasons, this murmur is very rarely heard in adults. I mentioned earlier a joke that grading the intensity of murmurs is sometimes based on how experienced an examiner needs to be in order to hear it. This has actually been studied. In 2006, a group administered a computer-based test to 860 clinicians at all stages of training, which measured competency in hearing and identifying abnormal heart sounds and murmurs, along with abnormal venous and arterial pulsations. Here's what they found. The bars represent overall test scores for various categories of clinicians. The resolution of this video may be inadequate to read, to read the specifics of the graph, so I will summarize it by saying that the relatively short leftmost bar is for preclinical medical students, and the relatively short rightmost white bar is for mid-level professionals such as nurse practitioners and physician assistants. The taller three gray bars in the middle are for cardiology fellows. With these three exceptions, all other categories of providers scored equally well. This includes third and fourth year students, interns, residents, internal medicine attendings, family practice attendings, and even cardiology attendings. That's right, third year medical students were just as competent at identifying the presence of abnormal heart sounds and murmurs as cardiologists. It should be noted that the study did not address whether or not there were differences in the clinician's abilities to use the exam data to make appropriate diagnostic and therapeutic decisions. I would certainly hope that there would be a difference between students and cardiologists then. The authors of the study concluded, cardiac examination skills do not improve after the third year of medical school and may decline after years in practice, which has important implications for medical decision making, patient safety, cost-effective care, and continuing medical education. One might be inclined to further conclude from the study that because more experienced clinicians scored no better than medical students, there is no reason to attempt to get better at identifying and describing murmurs since this will ultimately be unsuccessful. I personally think this would be a greatly erroneous conclusion. Instead, I take away from this study that physicians collectively do a very poor job at working to improve their physical exam skills currently, and if anything, the study suggests the increased need for conscious practice. The bottom line is that if you are a medical student or resident and you think you hear a heart murmur which your attending physician doesn't appreciate, don't necessarily assume that you are wrong and the attending is right. The opposite scenario may be equally likely. So if you're still with me at this point and you've made it this far, I'm going to assume that you have a decent amount of interest in the cardiac exam. Therefore, I will reward you with a little cardiology trivia here which may score some points on rounds. There are a number of specific heart murmurs that have been named after the clinicians who first described them. I'll go through five of these here. First, a mid to late apical diastolic rumble heard in aortic regurgitation, which can mimic mitral stenosis. That is the Austin Flint murmur. Next, the phenomenon in which the highest frequency components of an aortic stenosis murmur radiate to the apex mimicking mitral regurgitation? That's the Galvardin phenomenon. A murmur of pulmonary regurgitation occurring in the setting of pulmonary hypertension? The gram steel murmur. A mid-diastolic murmur heard at the apex during acute rheumatic fever? Carrie Coombs murmur. Lastly, a diastolic rumble heard in stenosis of the left anterior descending artery. That's Doc's murmur. I will leave you with one final point of trivia. The Austin Flint murmur, Graham Steele murmur, and Carrie Coombs murmur are, as far as I know, the only eponymous physical findings in the body which contain the physician discoverer's first and last names. I hope you have found this lecture on heart murmurs both informative and useful. Once again, this has been Eric Strong of the Palo Alto Veterans Hospital and Stanford University.